it was a, another blessing to have you come give us your time and give us the music to set it. And as usual, God has provided just the right songs. We have only one announcement, and that'll be next Sunday. After service, we're going to decorate the church for the Christmas holiday. And so those who could stay and help would shorten the time it takes to do that. You all see the nativity scene out front. I've got to turn this off. It's beeping at me. <laughs> but uh, that's just part of the decorations. We'll be decorating inside next week. So if you can stay, that would be great. With that, uh, I'm going to go into the message. And we're grateful for the church, both here in the building and wherever you're watching from. We're all part of the church. And that's part of what the message is about today. So I'd like to welcome you this Sunday before Thanksgiving. Last week, Connie gave us a great and stimulating message on gratitude for all that we have and many things that are often accepted without recognition. She helped us remember, as James said, all generous giving and every gift from, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or slight hint of change. And she reminded us of the things we take for granted and how much we should appreciate them. And in some ways we do, but it was kind of unconscious. Uh, things like the warmth, things like taste and smell and the different, different odors and aromas, the different flavors and how when you bring them together as in mixing uh, different seasons and spices, you make a dish that you would never expect out of each of this. Like if you took a spoonful of salt, it would not be so much fun as having it all properly seasoned and talked about musical notes and instruments and gave us a demonstration of how individually they just sound like something, but coming together they actually make a, a melody, a song, uh, something that communicates to our hearts and our spirit. And uh, we learned about various colors. And she brought these all together, and all these pieces, I was thinking as she was talking, it also reminds us that the church is made of many different and diverse people all in the Holy Spirit, brought together in one place and being mixed as we, the church, meet together and serve each other and care for each other and exasperate each other once in a while, maybe more than once in a while on occasion. So today I'd like to talk about the church and the beauty of the church and hopefully that you are thankful for it, not just Freedom Life Center as a local church, but the church writ large, which we're all part of if we're in Christ. <clears throat> Our differences in abilities and gifts when they're brought together under the leadership and provision of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Trinity writ large, <clears throat> become a beautiful harmony, or can. An, an average life lived in God and actively participating with Him can be an extraordinary life. Maybe not from the world's perspective, but as a class, God is beautiful and faithful and good. And he makes our lives different as we recognize and appreciate and allow him to work in them. And for those of you who have been in, the, in church for a while, in the body of Christ for a while, there are moments in your life I'm sure you realize that. And there are other moments where it seems like it's pretty quiet and where is he? But he's always there as the song mentioned. So, so each of us are not accidentally in the church but are all here by God's design to grow and to help one another to grow, to become more mature Christians. So as we give thanks to God, do we consciously include his church and him in it and forming it and our various members, even the ones that rub us a little wrong, which by the way, we may rub others a little wrong on occasion. <clears throat> Do we give thanks for these people? Do we give thanks for one another? Do we recognize and encourage one another as indispensable in our lives? No matter how awkward it may seem on occasion, there's something happening there if we'll just allow it to happen and participate with God in growing. So we should give thanks, and I hope we'll do this as we think of things to thank on Thanksgiving Day, Thursday. So the church is a gathering of those called out from the world by the Holy Spirit as believers in God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the core element in God's strategy for providing human witness and physical presence along with his creation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Local manifestations of these groups are like Freedom Life Center, 
But the church is universal. You know, we have brothers and sisters all around the world. We have hundreds of years, centuries, of other believers that we will be with in the final days, in the new creation. So when did the idea of the church for first, accord, first occur? Now before answering this, I want to ask, put up a slide on an iceberg. There you go, that's an iceberg. You probably all know that. <clears throat> but, but did you know that 90% of the iceberg is underwater? So as big as that looks, let's have the next one. That's what it really looks like. And it's not just deeper, it can be more than 100 times broader in all directions because the way the buoyancy is, it's just a high point sticks out. So it's kind of like if you go to Hawaii, it's really the top of a volcano. Just think how deep it is around there. It's a very big volcano, but we just see this little island, which has a few big hills. So the church is like this in ways that we don't appreciate. We see the local church and maybe other churches we go to on travel or vacation or holiday or with friends or even the other churches in our community. We're only seeing the, the tip of the iceberg, just some small semblance of it. So why do I say that? Because I think it's important for us to gain a perspective that the church is so much than the moment by moment experience we have locally and with one another. Even though those are very important and being used of God as we allow them. But that the church is not something so limited, but that there's a great deal of depth on it. And if you think about the depth of the iceberg below the surface, <clears throat> Think about the fact that the question I asked when the first church occurred is really the first church occurred, and Ephesians speaks to this, it was in the mind of God before the creation. So before time began, God already was aware of the church that would be the body of Christ as a physical manifestation along with the rest of the creation. He didn't all of a sudden have a surprise moment on the day of Pentecost. I hope that says something to you. What I'm trying to get across on that is the beauty of God's plan for us is amazing. Maybe beauty is we think about like lipstick and hairdos and stuff, but, but uh, not me, but, uh, but that, uh, that's beauty. But beauty is so much more than that. Beauty is on Thanksgiving Day, no matter how you work it, you'll be in touch with your family or if you're fortunate, you'll be together with your family, just like the more often we can have more people together, we enjoy that. And yet church is meeting right now as we meet with each other in spirit through Zoom and other means that uh, YouTube and other ways that you can meet and communicate if you allow yourself to be open to that. If you have loved ones that are away in school or in the service or they're working somewhere else in the country, are they out of your heart? Are they out of your mind? I don't think so. I'm sure, like we do, uh, we pray for them daily, we, we think about them, uh, we call them on a moment's emotion, well, about, hey, I want to talk to my son, or whatever, hear the grandkids. The church is like that if we let it be. It is like that. It's us who limit it, just like it's us who limit experiencing God's active presence in our life, just because we don't recognize how we're hearing aids, so they're... There are times I don't have an on, and Maria's talking to me, I don't even know she is. Now, she accuses me of not listening, but I always have the hearing aids to blame, so I turn them on quickly again, yeah. or turn up the volume or something. Well, sometimes we're like that with God, and he has to tap us to get us to uh, wake up and listen, see what's going on. So, <clears throat> the letter of Ephesians, or to Ephesians, which is a question of was it written to only Ephesus or was it written to the t cities around? Many of the manuscripts they have found have not got Ephesians written in, but it was in like a, a form letter that Paul put together to give to the various churches in that area. But it is a letter out of all the ones that he wrote that does not to seek to correct the church. I think that's interesting. You know, if you read Corinthians, he's correcting various problems. If you read Colossians, Galatians, you know, <clears throat> he's correcting problems. In Ephesians, he's not correcting problems. He has two major parts. The first three chapters talk about God and all that he is and all he's doing in the church. 
And the next three chapters are about how the church functions with each other and with God. And if you actually look at it, it's kind of like, if you see the scales of justice, you know, they hang there by the Lady Justice and it's got a bar with two trays under it. And the idea is for them to be in balance. Well, in the fourth chapter begins with some translations say to be worthy, but the word really implies a balance. So because of all that God is and has done with us and who we are in the church, the balance is for us to live the way of Christ in response and independence so that everything works together. All that he's doing and all that we're being are in harmony with each other. That makes sense to you. <clears throat> so it goes on. It's the story of the church and us and all those who trust in Christ. Me, you, all of us. We're now a vibrant part of the continuation of the story of the good news. The first three chapters are the good news from before creation all the way up to Christ's coming. The second part of the chapter is where we fit in on living it out, going on into eternity. It reveals the full dynamics of Christ's church, like this iceberg shows the bottom first, all that God's doing. And then the top, which is the church, maybe you could say, what's being visible in the world. <clears throat> in chapter one, he, he says in verse three to six, and this is from the message, how blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He is the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, before time began, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. So you can see the story starts way back when and it begins to go forward. So as you see the church, I'm hoping, my hope for this message uh, is that you begin to thank God for the church more regularly. By members, by name maybe, by functions, by the various dynamics, but you pray for one another, pray for the church, be sensitive to what's going on in the churches under severe persecution in other parts of the world, whether it's China or India, wherever. So the, it, the eternal roots, the bottom of the iceberg, and the life in God were in him before creation and continue to be there, be there behind and under us as the Trinity's presence is active. You know, the last song we sang was about he's in the room, he's in the house with us, he's always with us. We're two are gathered in his name, not only is in us individually, he's in us together, the Lord's present even right this moment. We don't have to ask for him to be present. We can give thanks that he is present, and we do. Yet, uh, we often see the church and individual members, including me, not really living up to this expectation. Uh, we profess to belong, and yet we don't seem to live up to those words that kind of say how we think we're supposed to be looking or others who should be looking. Sometimes we look at others and, you know, uh, Jeff says that we measure ourselves by our intentions and others by what they're doing. Uh, and if, if we measure ourselves by our, what we're doing, it's not always, not always in line with our intentions, but we give ourselves a pass. So we look at others and we see that. We, we see things in the church. It's not hard to find media with saying something about a leader of a church having done this, you know, whether it's financial, misuse, or running away with somebody, or doing some other things. But they're all part of the church if they're truly in Christ, so what does that mean? Through our present eyes of flesh, we look at the church around us and, and where we may attend, whatever way we are attending, and it's easy to think that we see the world, see it as the world, that it's ineffective and perhaps even irrelevant. And I hope you don't think that way, but I think we all have times of wondering. 
And that's not bad. It's okay. God knows that. We just need to keep looking and talking and speaking. We read of the failings of various churches. We look around and often think in comparison to the world's large number. The majority of church members are everyday people or even seemingly lesser members of society. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're not always in harmony with each other. We're not always showing God's love to each other. It's not because it's not there and it's not possible, but we're failing to appropriate that. All these problems are in principle experienced with the first century. That's why all those other letters are about correcting those churches, you know. Sometimes we think, well, I wish I lived back then because then the church was really doing big things. No, the church was like our church, struggling, having people missing the, the behavior they should be doing, wondering about God, and then seeing God show up in various ways as miracles happened or testimonies were given, just like we could have, just like we do have. It's the same. The society we live in today may have more technology, but if you look at the Roman Empire and the society of that time and throughout the world over the centuries, it's not changed that much the way people treat one another. If you look at China right now, being a Christian or any other religion is actually being you know, suppressed and being sent to indoctrination camps and, and worse. You could find the same thing in, in any other country. And over the history of the church, various denominations have persecuted other denominations and vice versa. All thinking they, owe, they know God and own him in the way they understand. And they call themselves Christians, both, both members of the opposition. When you look at World War I, most of the European countries participated, they would say they were Christian countries. So, what gives? Well, remember uh, that God, in 1 Corinthians, basically we have from Paul, remember that the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Think about the circumstances of you call, brothers and sisters. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were born to a privileged position. But God chose what the world thinks is foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world thinks weak to shame being strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus, him, God, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If the church could live up to the world's standards, just by people doing things, it wouldn't really reflect on God at all, except that he wasn't necessary. One of our dangers, as we live in a fairly prosperous society, although I think with COVID, uh, maybe or many of us have a little more struggling now, is that we can buy a lot of things we want without having to pray excessively over can we get it. Now, I know there are people in our congregation and, and in churches written across this country, as well as the world, that don't have that. In fact, I'm reminded of a story, I think I may have shared this once before, but a Chinese Christian uh, was sent to get a postgraduate education at a university in California, <clears throat> and this was, believe it or not, over 30 years ago, but anyway, he participated in local churches while he was there. And so when he was getting ready to leave, they go through a goodbye party and asked him what was the biggest thing that struck him. And he said, he said, what struck him the most about church that he'd gone to, their church and others in the United States was that we don't seem not to have to labor in prayer to receive what we need as a church to function. We can just buy it. Whereas where they are, they don't have that kind of financial resources in the churches that he's in. And they pray and God provides in ways that are unexpected. And he, he said, I, I think God provides both ways, but sometimes when you have to pray for it, I think you appreciate it more.
And yeah, that struck me, it stayed, it stayed with me. I mean, I heard that 30 years ago. But it stayed with me all these years because, you know, there was a, there was a missionary, Hudson Taylor, and he was back in England talking to people. And the board of the large church that he was talking to wanted to give money, so they wanted to have his advice on how to raise the money. And he looked around the room, and you know, some of them are bankers, and they were all like very prosperous citizens in the city they lived in. And he said, I think you could all do that right here in the room before you go out of it, in the, within the resources you have. That was not necessarily what they wanted to hear, obviously, but it just makes the point. God gives us things to be stewards of as part of the beauty of being in the church. We have the privilege to share in each other's lives. We are all brothers and sisters. We are in unity in Christ. And <clears throat> I'm grateful for Freedom Life Center and what we have had here over the years. And I'm grateful for the church which Lord. Even, even, and one of the things that's, that I've expanded my understanding of here at Freedom Life Center, or God's expanded my understanding, is just how denominational division shouldn't be divisions among people. If we are all in Christ, we may not understand exactly how to serve one another in Christ, but we are in Christ. You know, if we are, my brother and I are from the same mother, father, and that should be a reason we help each other as a starting point, even if we disagree. And it is, because he doesn't always agree with me, and I don't always agree with him, but I think it's he that doesn't agree with me, but uh, that's a joke. <clears throat> but uh, we're both uh, relatively hard heads, and uh, over the years I've learned that, you know what, whenever I've really needed him, he's always been there for me, and I've tried to be likewise. And I think that's, we need to have that mindset with one another. Even, even now, even more so in our society right now, for those who voted for one presidential candidate and those who voted for the different candidate, remember, first and foremost, you're Christians. You can't hate this other person who didn't vote your way. You know, that, that's putting the country above God. That's putting the party above God. God is first and foremost. We'll live through the process, and God will use the process to make us better and more Christ-like if we allow him to do that. So, <clears throat> perhaps the church as we know it is exactly what God created to provide the perfect conditions and proper company to grow by the Holy Spirit's involvement up into Christ-likeness. You might think, well, yeah, back there when it was first set up. No, I'm saying if over the centuries, churches have always had these dynamics of wrestling and working together, and yet the message of Christ continues to be spread, the message of Christ continues to find people and bring them into the kingdom over the centuries, then maybe the way the church is is the way it's supposed to be, a place to live out what we are being taught and led by the Spirit, taught by the Word, inside the family. It's like when the baby comes in the house, they take over the house kind of by their needs and their wants. All of us who have had children know that feeling of how, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning and you're dead tired and all of a sudden the baby needs you to get up and get it. And so maybe you lay there and wonder which one of you is going to get up and do that, see who can wait out the other person. <laughs> or maybe you made a deal because, but, but anyway, you have to do it. But eventually the baby begins to learn other behavior that's better for living within the family, and we're teaching them hopefully to become better citizens. But also, if we're Christian, Christians, the way we treat them hopefully reflects Christ to them. The way we treat one another hopefully reflects Christ to them as we husband and wife love each other. That's part of what chapters four, five, and six are about in these relationships that are lived out before Christ, but before the world. So if the church has been like this, do you not think that God could just make a perfect church that never had fights or arguments? 
and he just hasn't got around to it for the last over 2,000 years? What do you think? Maybe we're missing the point that we're really here, and instead of leaving one another and not talking to one another when we're in disagreement, we have to find a way to reconcile and draw close to one another and give God the glory for being ena enabling us to do that and giving us, as it says in Philippians, both the, the will, the desire to want to do that and enabling us to that. He says he gives us the will and the means to do his good purpose, to serve his will. That's, some, that's something to give thankful for. I, I think that's something, that's something beautiful. I mean, if you're a husband and a wife, having that gift of being able to do those things can make your marriage stronger and more beautiful. And I know some of you, and that's happened in your marriage and it's happening in your marriage. And, and sometimes it happens and it goes well and it sometimes is a dip. But we've got to keep, us, keep on keeping on. It's a long road in the same direction. And trusting that he's with us, he's in the room with us, he's in us, and we're here for one another. Not to think better of ourselves than the other, but to be a servant to one another. So I think, I think that's beautiful. Because I have to confess, I didn't really come up with that in my family. That wasn't the model that I saw. And I'm not sure I did a lot better with, for my son, but I, hopefully a little better. And he's doing even better, I hope. And I think that's what we want. We want our children to be better and doing better than we. And I don't just mean by money or, or fame or whatever. Those are passing the qualities of life and recognition of living with one another and recognition of the vibrant presence of Christ in our lives and the Spirit of God moving us. So, the church is not an ideal to be striven for. Think about that. The church is not an ideal to drive towards, right? Because we're supposed to become Christ-like. The church exists. It is. It is. It has been from before creation in God's plan and mind. It exists. We're within it. See, we're trying sometimes to take our worldly view and act like a, the church is a corporation and we want the corporation to succeed and we want to be part of a successful corporation. But in God's view, the church is a success. It's doing what he wants already. It's causing people to be changed. It's causing, it's showing Christ can make the difference. And I hope he's making a difference in your lives, wherever you are. I know these are stressful times and times that are challenging. Even maybe you're what you believe, but those things should make you stronger. Eugene Peterson wrote a book which actually triggered me on some of this stuff, and then I looked at Ephesians and studying that for the last month or so. But in the book, it's the title of the book is Practice Resurrection. His simple point is, if you're in Christ, what the Bible says, we're resurrected with Christ. Are we living resurrection? Are we res are living a resurrection-like life, a Christ-like life? And that's what Ephesians is about. He writes that we are a witness to the Holy Spirit's formation of congregation out of a mixed bag of humanity that becomes our congregation. And then he's going to list a bunch of things, and several of them, I could say I am, and there's not the positive ones. The congregation is made of a broken, hobbled, crippled, sexually abused, spiritually abused, emotionally unstable, passive, passive-aggressive, neurotic men and women, men at 50 who have failed a dozen times or more and know that they will never amount to anything, women who have been ignored and scorned and abused in a marriage in which they had been faithful, people living with children and spouses in deep addiction, Lepers and blind and deaf and dumb sinners, fresh converts excited to be on the new life, spirited young people, energetic and eager to be guided into a life of love and compassion, mission and evangelism, a few seasoned saints who know how to pray and listen and endure, and a considerable number of people who pretty much just show up. He says, I wonder why they do. 
There, are, there they are, the hot, the cold, the lukewarm, Christians, half Christians, almost Christians, generation whatevers, angry, ex-previous other church, sweet new converts. We don't get to choose them. We are blessed to be with them. Do you feel that way? I do. I do. Because I could, be, I could qualify to be thrown away. I know that. Paul wrote that. Paul wrote that he was the chief of sinners. That's how he understood his previous life before he came to Christ and in all the years that he served Christ. He just felt it was a great good fortune and blessing that God allowed him to have his eyes opened and to be able to minister. I hope you feel that way. All and any that the Holy Spirit brings our way and forms a community for love to grow and be grown in. That's who that group of definitions are about. For us to become one in Christ, and then he goes, in, and that's what chapter four, verses one to seven, which I'm going to read. All and any of the Holy Spirit brings our way and forms a community of love to be grown in, grown in. For us to be one in Christ Jesus, I there, the president of the Lord, that's Paul, urge you to live, but I would say that's me too, worthily of the calling which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you too were called to be one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But to each one of us, grace was a given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. His, and his gift is infinite. That's how tight the measure is. It's like, can, can God love one of us more than the other? God does everything perfectly. When God loves, it's perfect. It's complete. It's as much as it can be. It's not like when you're trying to win your father or mother over against your brother or sister. We're not in competition with each other. We're here to be helpful to each other. So I'm very glad and grateful to be one of these who God in his great love has brought into the church in spite of my failures, without regard to who I was. For in Christ we have a new humanity. He miraculously, miraculously, miraculously called me and you and us. He calls us beloved, beloved. Not just I love you, but beloved, my dearest ones. I'm grateful to be in church with you and I think she's beautiful. I hope you do. And I hope you remember to give thanks for the church and for Christ, who is the head of the church and the church is his body. So with that, <clears throat> you're going to get out a little early. Don't tell Jeff, although I know he's watching because he sent me a text. <laughs> but think about it and give joy. Let it be a source of joy as you let it flow through you and a source of encouragement. It doesn't mean it's easy but you can be enabled to do it and to find joy and do it. Remember, an average life can be extraordinary in Christ. So I'm gonna cast a blessing. Father, we do thank you for your plan of the church. We thank you for being able to be in the church, to be even part of this local church, Freedom Life Center. We thank you for our leadership and our very members and the many people who do things, so many things that are being done around here that we don't see by people you work through, but also what you're doing. The great work you're doing in our community, in our country, in spite of what appears to be difficult times and challenges, we trust you. We look forward to being able to deal with the things that are challenging and hard and to rejoice as we come out the other end, recognizing it was all in your hands all along. We just thank you now and pray for us to be safe, that you would provide this vaccine soon and that you would keep us free from the COVID and that we might worship you and respect one another and love one another. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great Thanksgiving. We'll be back here on next Sunday. Jeff will be teaching and then we'll have the uh, Decorate the Church building. God bless you all.